Hey, good morning. Good to see you, sir. Did you get your haircut? I <laughs> just fell out. I love it. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Matt. Just in case you were curious. Uh, you may notice we have like a, a first time front row visitor here with my wife. We, uh, we had the, we know we had a cross to bear. We had to let Nana and Papa all watch Noah. So he had, his, he had an overnighter last night. Needless to say, we partied like we were 45 and uh, we're like at, you know, at home and, and ready to be in bed about 10, 15, 10, 30. So like, woo, I'm so tired. And then we got to sleep in. 45 minutes today. Come on. You might be wondering why I look so spry and well rested. Yes, we did. We did. We did. Come on in. Deanna, everybody. Yes. Yes. That's right. You were on the interwebs. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah. You guys watch the games this weekend? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. I was, I was a little frustrated that Purdue lost. Oh, the, oh, the whole bracket's just yeah, totally messed up. Yeah, so frustrating. So frustrating. Yeah, I'm writing strongly worded letters as we speak, and uh, um, I kid, I kid. Um, yeah, so a uh, couple of announcements. So next week, we will not be meeting in person. I will send out an email this week that will have... I did, and then um, Jesus said no, so take it up with him, okay? <laughs> no, we'll talk a little bit about it, but I've got, I'll send out an email, and I'll actually have an, uh, an audio recording for you guys. I might do a video if you guys, I don't know, we'll see. But um, the Lord's giving, giving, giving us something, but it's more of a, yeah, you'll understand when I send you the email. So. But we'll talk through some of the practicals of what we're thinking, so... Um, but yes, yeah, so we, after today, we will not meet again until Easter morning. That's the Resurrection Sunday. Yes, 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 yes. So, um, so no service next week, and I will, I will email you about midweek with the document that will just have it in writing what we're going to talk about today. Is that fair? Okay, good deal, good deal. Um, I had the, we had the, the chance, the privilege, if you will, to... Um, uh, sit with a, a, f- a couple friend of ours this week, and uh, he just got back from Pakistan. So he went to Pakistan on a just kind of a, a yeah, missionary trip, and um, they're experiencing horrific persecution right now. And so he was telling stories of um, he walks into this room, and uh, him and three other guys are there, and. and it's not like a single file line like they have in the States for prayer. It's literally they're just mobbing him, pulling on him. And he's got the translator, and he calls the translator over, and the translator says, oh, this, this woman, she just said that her daughter was kidnapped because she became a believer, and now she either has to renounce Jesus or they're going to kill her daughter. And, and he's sitting there, and she's, they're like, will you, you know, will you pray for her? And he's like, what? I, what, do I, what do I do? You know, um, and so horrific things. Um, he told some stories that I ah, man just yeah made me want to weep. He said we went and uh, he went into the this room, this event they had one night, and though it's packed, hundreds of people just wanting to hear the gospel. They're say like half of them are saved, the other half aren't, and um, they start this worship song, and they're just singing the same lyrics for 35, 45 minutes. And it's like they're not even singing super loud. They're just kind of whispering and, and just kind of being with the Lord. And he looked at his translator and he said, what, what are they singing? What are the words of this song? This is like an amazing song. And they, the translator said, I want to get the words right. Even if we die, our faith will live forever. It's the only song they're singing. Even if we die, our faith will live forever. I mean, you want to... Oh. It's like, he was talking about how, and, 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 the, and the gospel is spreading like wildfire there. It's spreading like wildfire. 
And so we sat there in this like, oh my gosh, Lord. In this upside down kingdom. And I don't get it, but where at times the harder the harder it is to say yes to Jesus, the more cost there is, the deeper the revelation of him is. So it's just profound and deep. And so as I was, as we've been sitting here this morning, I, I wanted to, um, many of you know as you've been journeying with us that we are in a season where we feel like the Lord has highlighted the biblical calendar, the pattern, that these patterns are eternal, right? And that... Um, whether we, whether we go back and, and we look at the different things in the Old Testament into the New, the patterns that, that God set forward in the, in the calendar were coming into a season where um, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and then we have Good Friday, and then we have Easter, and there is a rhythm of that that is intended to bring breakthrough. I'm gonna say that again. I think it's really important for us to hear. There is a pattern, there's a rhythm to the calendar that God literally ingrained in the fabric of time that when, we, when our hearts are in tune with that pattern, it's our participation in the transformation of the gospel. And we've talked about this multiple times. Multiple times we've said, we can actually rearrange the furniture in here and we can feel like we're doing something productive. All the while, Jesus is in the corner with a sledgehammer going, I want to tear down some walls. And it's the invitation, like once again, like this is what we're celebrating in Easter, is before there are signs and wonders in your midst, you are the greatest sign and wonder. That's the reality. That's what Easter represents is that when you let the Lord tear down walls and you have joy and you have hope and you have peace that you couldn't get anywhere else in the patterns that you were living, it's when, when he gives, when he tear down, tears down the wall and you get unlocked in that, it's what's yours, but it's been yours the whole time. That is the sign and the wonder that people go, you're different and I don't know how and I don't know why. That's transformation. You have to be the sign and the wonder before gold dust falls out of heaven, before people get healed. I get all that. That stuff's amazing. But we start going after that without me being transformed. I'm, trying, I'm, I'm, a, I'm giving a Judas kiss. I want the benefits of intimacy without ever being heart connected with him. And so this is the thing that as, as Rachel and I have been praying into this week, we feel like, I mean, that, even if we die, our faith will live forever. I've been sitting in this when Jesus says in John 12, and he says, no, 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 a seed must go into the ground and it must die. And we have felt like the Lord is like, will you prioritize my voice? Will you listen to my voice with fresh ears? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know how, but yeah, I will. And I feel like the Lord said, like, if I knew there was something important on Rachel's heart, I literally would shut everything else down and say, baby, just talk to me. I want your heart. I want your heart to be free with me to come alive. And we feel like Jesus is doing that with us this season. And I'm going, whatever needs to die in me, let it die. Whatever I need to let go, let go. I want to be able to come into agreement, Jesus, with you when you say, even if I die, our faith will live forever. So all of that to say, <laughs> that was not, I did not anticipate this. Jesus, Jesus, I want to do a worship experience with you. And I, I just, oh, I can't see. Oh. 20, just John 12, 20 through 26. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they, they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and they asked him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I want to pause here. I'm going to teach for just a second and then we're going to do a worship experience. You have these Greeks, you have these Gentiles, you have these foreigners and Jesus has, do you remember the scene when he says, no, 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 I've come to, to bring the message to the Israelites and then the woman, the Samaritan woman says, but even the dogs get the scraps and he laughs and goes, oh, your faith, it's yours. Jesus knew his ministry was to the Jews. These Greeks, these Gentiles come and in one question they come unto Philip who they thought was a, a Greek too. 
And they said, hey, will you introduce us to Jesus? So Philip goes and says, hey, Jesus, will you meet these Greeks? And Jesus immediately knows the Spirit's on this in a new way. He's, the Spirit is ushering in the moment when all of the world will know that I am, I am king. That's why he says here, ready? Um, they came to Philip. Right? And, and Philip came and told Andrew, and then in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And then Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That's what he's saying. He's like, Oh, there it is. A thousand Greeks could have asked him, but this moment, this is the Spirit's on this moment. Right? That tenderness to the Father's heart. Oh, yep. Yep, Holy Spirit, I, I feel that there's a, different, it's, there's a difference in your tone right now. Now's the moment. And then, of all the times, here's the revelation he gives. Most assuredly, another way of translating that in the Aramaic, I tell you an ancient truth. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. This is the invitation I want to do for worship this morning. In some small way, to be able to come into agreement with those group of Christians in Pakistan that are saying, even if I die, my faith will live forever. Even if you ask this grain of wheat to fall and die, I believe you will resurrect it. Make sense? So I'm gonna read this passage two, three times, and I just wanna invite you to let Holy Spirit illuminate. And when he illuminates it, whatever the phrase is, right? This is the beauty of that worship experience for the, in, in Pakistan. It wasn't a complex worded system. It wasn't a, a perfect theology. It was literally a cry from the heart, not the mind, the heart, that said, I don't want to die, but even if I do, I know that my faith will live forever. Whatever the phrase is, it can be a phrase in this text, it can be something that you just resonates within you. I just want you to like worship the Lord right now in that. And as we read it, we want to descend from our minds into our hearts. And there we stand before the presence of God, holding our heart out with open hands saying, it's all yours. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you to do what you only you can do. The true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. And so in the name of Jesus, we ask that the true spirit of worship would come forward right now. That our hearts would make agreement with what you're doing, Lord. Yeah. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee. And they asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So Philip came and told Andrew. And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. 
Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and they asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. I tell you an ancient truth. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. It is our honor and our privilege to hear your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yield again to you, Jesus. Even if we die, our faith will live forever. Thank you, Jesus, for the church in Pakistan that's teaching us how to worship. We honor them, Jesus. that there's nothing we want to hold on to. There's no comfort, there's no peace, there's no control, there's nothing that is more important than you, Jesus. So we present our bodies, we present our hearts, we present our lives on the altar of your presence. Everything we are, everything we have is yours now and forever. Whatever you ask, we're in, Jesus. To be trusted with your voice is the highest honor we could ask. Return us to a dependency on you that's childlike. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy. We magnify you, Jesus. We exalt your name. High and lifted up. High and lifted up. Catch us up in your story, all of our life for your glory. Jesus, you're worthy. You're worthy, Jesus. In 
the name of Jesus, we just declare that all chatter must cease in our minds. We silence it. We call forward that first love, that first love with you. Come on. Um, we've been talking the last couple weeks of this these patterns. I've been obsessed with patterns lately. It may be because, like the repetitive things, maybe because my son is in that season where he loves to drop things. Wherever he's sitting, he just loves to drop them, and then dad has to pick them up. And that game can go on for eternity. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm reminded of Chesterton. You guys know G.K. Chesterton? We probably don't know him. He died in the early 1900s. But if we know of him, he talks about this concept of eternal recurrence where he says, what if every sunrise the Lord makes it fresh because he never gets tired of the patterns? He says, what if, he says, and he uses the illustration, much like a kid can play peekaboo for hours on end, he says, and there's this, there's this capacity for eternal recurrence in an infant. They just think it's the coolest thing when you keep surprising them, right? For hours. And he said, what if every flower that comes up, doesn't matter how many daisies there are in the world, every daisy he makes like he's made it for the first time. What if his capacity for eternal recurrence is more like a toddler's? And unfortunately, we've gotten too old for that. And he said, what if God's actually younger than us? I just, I just love that illustration of what if God's actually younger than us in his capacity for eternal recurrence. And he's, every sunrise, he's going, oh, that was great. Let's do it again tomorrow. These patterns, we've tried to use language about this, right? I saw I, there was a couple weeks ago where I was talking about Walter Brueggemann's uh, paradigm that says orientation, disorientation, reorientation. It's a pattern, right? That they'll like, and, and if anybody's walked with the Lord in any, any, any amount of seasons, there's a way we're like, you know, <laughs> um, sometimes in orientation, we want to celebrate that, no, God is, there are rules to this thing, and God is a God of order and justice, Right and 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 men, when you sow what you you reap what you sow, and there's a, a give and a take with the Lord, right? And and we can actually so He gives the law, He gives parameters, He gives paradigms, and these things are like firm. You don't build a mount or you don't build a house willy nilly. Like no, there's structure to this thing. And so when we're in a season, we're like, oh no, it's ordered. It makes sense. I know when I I just I, when I worship the Lord, this is what happens. This is like orientation. And then you encounter something in your life. You encounter a season. You encounter an, a, a moment where you've been hurt or wounded or whatever the language is. And suddenly, that orientation doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't completely communicate God anymore. And suddenly, I'm thrown into disorientation where the world's not fair. The world's not just. And I'm waiting for this justice. And many times, we don't know what to do with disorientation. So we're just trying to run back to an orientation. We're trying to run back. A lot of our worship songs are about orientation. This is how, how, who God is. And so what happens, though, when I'm in a season of the disorientation, this is where the book Lamentations comes out of. Probably the most, least read book in all of Scripture because we don't know what to do with that pain. We don't know what to do with the Psalms where David's like, will you kill my enemies? Punch them in the nose and kill them. That's my paraphrase. <laughs> We love the Psalms. We're like, God, you're so beautiful. You're wonderful. And sometimes I don't want to go into disorientation because I, it, it, we have attached to it. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not faithful. This is, there's something wrong with me. This is actually unfaith to be in this season, which is the opposite of the scriptures. 
The Israelite people knew that because their relationship with the Lord was strong enough, that they were allowed to stand here in their disillusionment and their disorientation and go, you got to do something. This is on you. You called us out of Egypt. You're the one that brought us out of here. Why are the enemies triumphing over us? If we don't know how to put a language to our disorientation, we'll run back to an orientation and actually never get into the resurrection. Does that make sense? These are the patterns. This is literally the entire Old Testament. If you want to know where you're at in the journey with the Lord, you'll find it somewhere in the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament is a story of formation. Of how God took a people that were stiff-necked and, and, and stubborn. And he just journeyed with them. There are so many times where I find myself in a, in, a, in a position of life where I'm in disorientation. I find myself in a psalm and I'm like David who's going, how long, O oh Lord, are you going to hide your face from me? But when I go into church, I, you know, praise the Lord, he's here. I know this is truth. And it's ordered again, Right? It's in the messiness of disorientation. It's in the messiness of the grave. It's in the messiness of the cross that I have to actually believe there's a resurrection coming. Do you know all of my control issues flare up because I'm out of control in disorientation? It feels chaotic. I'm like, well, this must not be from the Lord. No, it's exactly from the Lord. That's what I want to talk about today. We're in a season where we are getting ready to celebrate. And it sounds so counterintuitive, only in the Christian church, only in, 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 with Christ, do we celebrate, hear, me, hear my language, the victim of murder. It's only in Christianity that we do that. Because that by all definitive standards, every other, every other world religion, they want the God that is powerful and just comes down and squashes his enemies. And we celebrate the one that got lifted up on a cross that literally entered into the darkness and he submitted himself to it. Yes, it's because of the resurrection. It's because he's now seated at the right hand of the... That's why we celebrate as well. But what we're celebrating in this coming season is the act of the cross. And why was it so important that Jesus had to yield himself to the cross, to the grave? Because we, Easter is not joyous and celebratory if the cross isn't painful and sad. Because the pattern that God put forward for us is that we, I'll just say I, as an American Christian, I need a pattern to make me look at the hard, disorienting stuff. I have to have it in my calendar because I will not sign up for that. This is why I love going to movies, because I can escape. I have to have a pattern where I have to look at the things that God is doing that are disorienting to me. Because it's in the love of the Father, He knows without going into the disorientation, you will not taste the resurrection. And okay, let me tell you, let me show you in scripture. Well, for instance, so this seed, right? Go to John 16. We'll get there. John 16 is where we're going to end up today. But here's what I want to say. So we're talking about the seed. Jesus gives this paradigm. The seed must go into the ground and die. He's literally putting another layer of metaphor on top of the pattern of the Old Testament, on the pattern of how God forms his people. We track him? Okay. Paul goes on. So Paul, after the resurrection, I need you to sit. So Paul goes on, and in, and, and in Romans 6, Paul talks about, no, 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 no. If you've been baptized into his death, this is what baptism was. If you've been baptized into his death, then surely you're going to be baptized into his resurrection. So what's Paul saying? When you get, why, why is baptism so important? Because it's the prophetic picture of your entire life. That these seasons where I went into the grave with Jesus, and I get resurrected again, Right? And that what Paul is saying is like, no, you don't understand. And he's talking to an audience that is being persecuted for their belief. Saying, no, no, you, this is all a part of the journey. That when you go into the grave again with the Lord, your baptism was the first moment that set the trajectory for your life. As you continue to yield to wherever Jesus is at, sure, there may be stuff that you have to walk through. But you better sure believe that if you participate in this death, if you participate in the disorientation, the pattern's already set. It's been predestined. Resurrection is coming. It's it's coming. 
It's for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. It's not glorifying the pain. It's believing that, no, this is the pattern of the Lord unleashing and unlocking things in me that have been in there and they're a part of my inheritance, but for whatever reason, I haven't been able to touch them. Does this make sense? So Paul says in Romans, yes, you died. Consider yourself dead to sin. You died. Right? He goes on in Ephesians and he says, this is why he says, you are in Christ. You've been resurrected in Christ Jesus. Right? I'm getting excited. Okay. Jesus, you're amazing. (laughs) So we find ourselves in him, right? Which is Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection. But we find ourselves here... Where, where Paul is saying we have such oneness with Jesus. We have such oneness that when Jesus says, hey, I need to, Paul understood this, I need, remember when he, he tells the, I think it was uh, the Corinthians, I can't remember exactly the address, forgive me, where he says, um, listen, the pattern that we're walking is we carry, we carry Christ to you. And whatever is lacking in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we will fill up in our sufferings for you. He's not saying that there was, a, there was a lack in what Christ did. He's saying that, that there are places, like for instance, there are places when Rachel and I got married, there are places that I knew about the love of God and I knew about who Christ was. As we have gotten married, what's happened is, is as we've learned to yield to one another, even when I've got a sword out and I'm saying, come here, I want to talk to you, right? <laughs> even when that's the case, and married people, you understand what I'm saying, right? The place where all of my stuff is coming out, and I, I, I wish it wasn't, but it is, and she just loves me right in the middle of that. She is filling up in my understanding, in my incarnational view of who Jesus really is. That's what Paul's saying. That's what the body of Christ is meant to be. We're so unafraid of big emotions. We're so unafraid of the darkness of the grave, because I've been doing it my whole life with the Lord. He's asked me to die. Hey, there's somebody there that's, that really needs loved on, but they're really scary and mean, I know, can you go love them? I'll go lose my life for them. That's the pattern. And what Paul says is you actually fill up in someone their understanding of Christ when you do that. Right? That's the pattern that we're talking about in this season. To the point that there's this section here where Jesus says the seed must go and die. And then I was sitting the other day uh, and I was sitting at the end of Jesus' journey about where we're at and uh, there's this scene where Jesus goes up and he overlooks, he goes up on the mountain and he overlooks the city and he begins to weep over the city. You remember that? I'm gonna read the, there's two passages, Luke, Matthew 23 and Luke 19, but this is the paradigm I wanna, I wanna anchor us in. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the ones who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And then in Luke 19, he says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. He, he's mourning and lamenting. And you, if you've walked this journey with anybody, you know this is the case. You know what somebody's heart needs to do to surrender to Jesus. Oh, if you could only see what I see because I'm outside of your situation. If, we, if, I, if you could only see it, I know your heart would break open before the Lord and you would know. Jesus is weeping over us going, if you only knew how good my love is for you, you'd lay everything down. If you only knew what would make your peace, what would truly bring you into the fullness of what your heart's been longing for. He literally is weeping over his bride right now in this season going, if you only knew what I had for you and the peace I have for you. But your eyes have hidden it. Which then begs the question, why? Because he's not talking to a bunch of Gentiles. He's literally talking to the the elect few who are leading the charge in the religious community. He's weeping over them. John 16, right? We're actually going to go to John 15, verse 26, and then move into this, but I want you guys to see this. Because once again, this is what we're answering or what we're trying to speak to. Why? Why the grave? What happens? What's going on here? What, What is the invitation year after year after year? 
1526. Jesus, this is the whole, this is his whole teaching on the Holy Spirit. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been made, you have been with me from the beginning. Verse 16, chapter, or yeah, chapter 16, verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. I want to pause there. Think about this. I remember growing up thinking, oh, because Jesus is the hero, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're the villains. And I remember Disney movies where it was very clear because the way they, they colored the, the villains. I knew exactly who were the villains were from the very beginning. It's the one that had the, had the apple, which is why I don't eat fruits and vegetables. Does that make sense? It's just a little bit of wisdom I'd like to bestow upon you guys. Um, but it's like if you... <laughs> Kim's like, you are an idiot. <laughs> So, that being said, but what I, what I, as I've gr- gone later in my life, what I've realized is he's literally saying, no, 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 you don't understand. The people that are going to kill me and kill you, they actually are convinced they're doing it for God. Yeah. Yes. They actually are convinced that they're serving God. They're convinced that they're doing, and I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, Jesus, I'm so sorry. How many times have I done that? I was convinced that I was right and I was convinced that my opinion was the rightest opinion and literally I thought I was serving the Lord by cutting someone's ear off. And if you've been in that place, you know what happens? And the Lord has to, when you get convicted of the Lord on that, all of a sudden you get really self-aware. Maybe I don't know him like I think I do. Oh, maybe I'm not as, maybe I'm not as wise as I think. I, maybe I'm not as tuned in as I was hoping I would be. Because, man, I, that stuff came out of my heart. Oh, all in the name of Jesus. Maybe that's just me. Okay, thanks for letting me confess. And suddenly I begin to realize, oh, his whole point is, no, no, they're going to be convinced that their way is the rightest way. Verse 3. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you you may remember that I told you them. And these things I do not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go away to him who sent me and none of you asks, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So Jesus' whole point here is saying, I'm telling you I'm going away and you guys are sad because I'm going to physically leave you. But what I'm telling you is, is to position you into what I have for you. I have to go away. Verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I did not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. This is the verse. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. We're going to read the rest of that in a second, but I want to pause on that verse. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. The word bear there means to carry a burden. So he's looking at his disciples and he's saying, I have walked with you and there is a measure that you have received everything I've asked you to receive. But in order for you to carry the anointing, the call, the ministry, the kingdom, whatever the language you want to put onto that, in order for you to walk out what, what God saw in you before the foundation of the world, I can't tell you those things right now because it would become a burden of responsibility. And that's not what I want to lay on you because they're, remember, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So the Lord knows without proximity to his heart, without face-to-face with him, 
I may get the call on my life, but it becomes my responsibility to walk out and I actually get further from connection with him because of the call and the anointing. So he's literally going, I can't tell you these things right now. Not because he doesn't want to. He's saying, no, no, no. Right now, you don't see yet. Right now, there actually needs to be a death. There needs to be a burial and then a resurrection and then you'll be positioned in a new way to see. Can you see that pattern playing out in your life? where you were so convinced of something in this season. And then all of a sudden, the Lord took you, for me, I'll use my language, the Lord took me through a season and put me in the bar. And all of my junk came out, and I was like, I had no right to throw a stone at anybody. Do you know that pattern has continued in my life? No matter how convinced I get of something, Jesus will sit me down and say, can I show you this about them? Can I show you this about what I'm doing right now? And suddenly I go, this thing is so much bigger than what I understand. Now, all of a sudden, there's a reverence in my heart because I realize every time I go to speak about what God's doing, I am literally in the holy of holies and I better take my shoes off. So to move in presumption and like, well, we figured it out. It's such arrogance that the father, and he's not even ticked at you about that. He's going, child, just come and die with me. There's so much I want to tell you. There's so much I want to awaken in your heart. There's so much that I have for you. This is why the Holy Spirit came, right? To convict the world of sin. But that word there, what we're talking about, why does he say that? It says, because sin is a distortion of the original DNA that you carry. All sin is a distortion of who you are. It is, a, it, is a, it is a perception of your reality that is off. And the Spirit has come to say, child, can I woo your heart back? Can you hear the song of heaven again? Can you hear my voice again and break partnership with the lies that have permeated the culture that you're living in? Child, will you step away again and come away with me? Right? The Spirit is wooing hearts, convicting the world of sin, saying that is a bankrupt image. That's a distortion of your reality. It's made you feel in control, and I understand why you wanted that. That's not what I have for you. Of righteousness, right? We now have Christ's righteousness. They says, that's why I have to leave. Because the righteousness that is yours in your inheritance is what Christ died on the cross for. That righteousness that is your DNA on full display. I, I'm going to say it this way. I'm getting excited. I'll use a guy smarter than me. C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory says that if we truly saw each other, if you saw what God created the person next to you to be, you would be tempted to bow down and worship of them. That is the glory. That is the eternal glory that each one of us carries. And I know you can look at me and go, whatever, Matt, okay, I've heard this before. I'm telling you, today, there is an invitation for you to lay down that mindset that has kept you from seeing it. Because that's the, that's the issue here. There are mindsets that we carry that block me from seeing glory in anybody else because I can't even see it in myself. And Jesus is going, no, 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 I have to go because I, the, the Holy Spirit needs to convict the world that there are bankrupt images that they're buying into that are just good enough. They allow us to survive and be good enough. And yet it's the opposite of what I've literally spent my life for, that you would see the righteousness, the glory you're called to carry, that you would be so face to face with Jesus that that eternal love dance would just take over. And no longer am I thinking about what God's doing. He's like, I'm literally in the middle of it. And when you're in the middle of it, you can't see it clearly. You just know he's a great leader. Like that, he's awakening hearts to that. Of sin, of righteousness, and then of judgment, because here's the other reality. Jesus goes, no, no, you don't understand. I'm going to the cross and I'm taking all of the distortion with me. Satan himself is going to be kicked off the throne. I'm going to parade his rear end around hell like a dog on a chain. He has no authority anymore. But so often what happens is, is we, get, we have a really big Satan because there's a distortion and I'm not convinced of who he says I am. So Jesus is literally looking at these disciples, begging them, Can you? no, 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 you don't understand. I've got so much I want to tell you. 
My heart is literally overflowing with revelation about who you are. It's overflowing with things that I want to partner with you in and to see heaven come to earth. But if I tell you them right now, you'll go and try and do them. And I'll actually lose your heart in that process. I don't care if you've walked with the Lord for 30 seconds or 300 years. This is the pattern we're in. Where Holy Spirit is whispering us. He's beckoning us again. Will you come to the grave with me again? Will you come to the cross? Well, what do you mean? I I got saved 20 years ago. I know, child. But there are actually paradigms. There's walls I got to knock down again. Because you put them up and you didn't mean to. And I'm not angry at all but will you come to the grave again? Verse 20, or verse 13. However, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. I have many things to say to you. Everything Jesus has is ours. So can we pause and say, the issue isn't on his end. And I remember when I was praying for, like I was uh, really contending for things in prayer, right? And he wasn't answering. I didn't think he was answering. You guys get that. And, and I knew I'd heard that tag phrase. Well, you know, it's always on your end, not his end, right? You're just not saying, and, and it was like a shame tape that would play in me. Well, I'm screwed up. I got to fix something else. Isn't that funny? You can actually take a truth of the kingdom and run it through your own filter, <laughs> And suddenly it becomes an invitation to shame or condemnation or guilt and has you like sink away from the heart of the Father. And then what happens is is then we end up just living in that place because we're we're familiar with that place. Right? Right? This is why in the Old Testament, when you remember the scene in Joshua at the beginning, when they cross the Jordan River, what's the first thing they do on the other side? They have everybody get circumcised. I remember asking the Lord about that one time. Like, What? So we cross the river, we're getting ready to go to these battles, and the Lord says, stop, circumcise the men. (laughs) Yeah, all the women are like, ha, 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 and the guys are like, oh, I need a timeout, I need a timeout. But I say that, and I was asking the Lord about that, and I felt like the Lord said, this was years ago, Matt, Every generation has to pay their own cost. And it was this moment of, oh, every season has its own cost to pay, right? But then this is why Paul says, but I don't even want to, I don't even talk about the cost when you see, when you see the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's the joy set before us. Like Jesus is literally, have you ever had this where he's like, (laughs) so many things right now are about Noah, but I'm like, Noah, Noah, and I'm trying to get him face to face with me right? And he's just doing this thing, right? I mean, is that not me? A hundred percent with the Lord? He's like, he's like, Matt, I want to sit with you. Matt, Matt. And I'm like, there's a movie over here. I'm gonna go do this over here, you know? And the whole time the Lord's like, face to face, face to face. Everything I have is yours. So the issue here, not through any shame filters, the issue is if everything has already been declared to us, then there are mindsets and paradigms that have kept it under wraps. Does this make sense? That's what sin is, right? The word sin is the word ponero. There's a couple different words for it, hamartia and poneros, right? Hamartia is a, is a compound word from ha, not ha-ha, but ha meaning without, and then meros, M-E-R-O-S. That's the root word, and it's without form. So the word sin is you are without your allotted form that you're supposed to carry. That's what it is. Poneros, right? A life of sin. It literally, poneros means hardship, toil, and striving. That's what it means. So as we're unpackaging this, right? Sin, we've we've reduced sin to like the behavioral systems or things we can see in the natural. So we can actually go, I don't have any sin in my life. 
oh, okay, got, good on you, well done. I got to sit with the Lord about two minutes, and He starts showing me motivations of my heart that I didn't know were in there. And so I'm in this place where it's like, once again, Jesus is going, no, 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 I've already, I, I, I've given you glory to carry, Matt. Will you, will you say yes to this pattern? Step into the cross and the grave with me and be in complete faith that I'm going to resurrect something that you've not seen or heard yet. Come on. It's a good word. It's a good word. To the point that Paul says in, in Philippians 3, if we want to talk about accolades in the flesh, if we want to talk about being somebody, I was a Jew of the Jews, baptized on the eighth day, right? I think he says a Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? He says, when, if we're going to talk about zeal for the Lord, there is nobody more zealous. I was literally killing people in the name of the Lord. If we want to talk about being studied, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I was the man. I was fastly ascending to the point that the, the, the high, high priests were sending me out to go sniff out the church. He says, I, I had ascended to every place of influence and position in the, in the capital of capitals, Jerusalem itself. And yet all of this I consider rubbish. None of that matters for the sake, and what does he say? Of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then he uses this phrase where he says um, that I would know him, the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. And so I believe, I believe that we are in this season right now. And once again, it, it, the invitation's always there. And you guys know this. It's, the invitation's always there. But then sometimes the Lord says, but this is a, this is a different invitation. Right? We, I, I've celebrated 37 Easter's in my life. You guys forgot how old I am? That's good. 37, this will be my, maybe this will be my 37th. I don't know how the math goes. Maybe it's 36. Yes. Maybe, it's th- maybe I lied. I'm sorry. And there have been different seasons where the Lord has said, oh, this Easter means something different than it did last Easter. And so I just want you to know it feels, as I pray for us, it feels like this is a season where the Lord is saying, I'm doing a mighty work in your people. Amen. And I need to speak to this place because I know some of you you may have a smile on your face, but there's a heart posture that is so tired of waiting. And you're like, I've heard this before, Matt. And I know. I want to declare that this is a moment, this is a Kairos moment of the Lord inviting you into the grave. And what I mean by that is it's patterns, it's systems of belief, it's, it's ways, it's paradigms of understanding, it's ways that I have approached the Lord for decades that he's inviting me to lay down at his feet again. For some of us, and I need you to see this, how you encountered the Lord 20 years ago is your biggest stumbling block to what he's doing right now. I need you to hear that. That what happened, and it was wonderful, and it was amazing, and then the Lord shifted. And the Lord says, I'm gonna do a new thing right now. And it's not, about, it's not that that doesn't matter. It's that we're all students in this thing together. We're all in the same place. And I feel like the Lord is saying that this is, that there's grace on this season for us to go into the grave with him. Now I can say that right now and it feels romantic. You need to hear me, this is Disney, right? Within two hours, this whole narrative happens. How many of y'all know when David says, I soaked my couch with tears, right? That's a lot of crying. But he says it in a sentence, and I don't feel it. So I go, oh, he went from orientation to reorientation like that. That's amazing, Lord. It's like I just, I just floated over the cross. Oh, that's so cool. But there's a participation. There's a fellowship of his sufferings. And it's not to glorify that, but it's to say that we're also unafraid of that. We're unafraid of that, the darkness of the grave. We're unafraid of the confusion because we know that resurrection is coming. 
And that's the place where I find, we find ourselves. As I feel like this is a season where the Lord is asking us collectively to go into the grave. And so I say that to say, um, that's what we're doing next Sunday. So it'll be two weeks before we see you. But Palm Sunday, um, it's one of my favorite Sundays to preach. And I've preached the same sermon for years, which is basically, um, it's the God I need, not the God I want. Jesus comes into the temple and they're convinced that he's gonna go pick a fight with the Romans. And he takes a hard right walks right to the money changers and starts flipping the tables. And he says, the problem's not the Romans. I need you to hear me. The problem's not the spiritual warfare that you're experiencing. The problem's not the battle in the second heavens. The the problem's not the person in the first heavens sitting down the road from you. That's all been dealt with. Jesus is saying, no, the problem's with a paradigm that you're carrying. I gotta flip the I gotta flip the tables. I gotta knock down a wall because I want you free so bad I gave my life for it. And I I just wanna offer if we can have the courage to hope again that that's what he's doing with open hands, I believe we're gonna experience a uh, a resurrection unlike you've ever experienced in your life. I believe that. So next Sunday, we're gonna be off, not in the sense that we're just not having church. We believe that the Lord has some work to do with you individually and with us individually. And so we just, we wanna position ourselves to hear every intonation of his voice and to say, we just want it, Lord. That's all we want is your voice. We wanna know where you're at and just be as close to you as possible. And so, uh, yeah. So we just invite you. Here's, Here's the best part. We invite you, you hear him. You wouldn't have hung out this long if you didn't. <laughs> and so if, that's a, if it's a beautiful day and you want to go walk in a park, go walk in a park. If it's a day where you go, I just, you know what, there's actually a trusted friend and I want to have them over for breakfast and I want to just talk about what Jesus is doing. And I haven't had the time to do that. If it's a place where you're going, you know what, I actually, there's been this church down the road that I really want to check out and spirits leading that, go check them out. Because we believe the kingdom is actively and vibrantly working in multiple places in this city. So we just release freedom for you to hear his voice, to be obedient to the grave he's called you to step into in full anticipation that he has so much more to say to you. But your heart connection is more important than any revelation he can release. Revelation outside of heart connection will produce a responsibility that weighs you down. Revelation outside of heart connection will produce a responsibility that will weigh you down. Revelation with heart connection creates a privilege of walking shoulder to shoulder with him. Does that make sense? Revelation without heart connection produces a responsibility that will weigh you down, thank you. Revelation with heart connection will produce a privilege of walking shoulder to shoulder with him. And then that verse that says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, becomes the DNA that you carry of, oh, there's no, there's nothing like partnership with him. Oh my gosh, it's fun. I'm telling, hear me, I need you to hear me. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, those are yours. I'm telling you, there are some seasons that it's heavy and you gotta like walk through the the Golgotha. But like what he has for you is to carry that in in your bones, in your DNA. And I'm not trying to get myself to joy again. It literally becomes the inheritance that is so birthed in here. It becomes my DNA, it's incarnated. And suddenly I can't help but leak hope because I'm convinced of his goodness. Come on. In the name of Jesus, I just declare, any places, Father, and I feel it right now in the spirit, I feel the warfare on it, any places where the enemy is trying to steal this seed, I just command it to leave right now in the name of Jesus. I speak life, I speak life into the soil, 
in the name of Jesus. I speak life where there has been death. I speak hope where there has been partnered, where there has been a partner with death and decay and despair. I speak life. In the name of Jesus, we lift off the burden, the burden of the enemy that tries to get you to spin in circles and have no victory. We cancel that yoke in the name of Jesus. I speak life. I declare in the name of Jesus to your spirit man and your spirit woman that no enemy, no, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I declare in the name of Jesus a little while longer. He's tarrying with you right now and he says, baby, can you hold on just a little bit longer? Can you hold on just a little bit longer? Because what I'm unleashing, your heart has been longing for since you were a child. I speak courage in the name of Jesus. I speak courage to say yes to you at all costs, Jesus. I pray, Father, for a divine moment of unmasking. Things that we thought were you, Lord, I pray that they would be unmasked in these next two weeks. That they would be unmasked and we would see with free, with, with, with free eyes what you're doing. I just declare in the name of Jesus, it is a time of judgment. Jesus is judging. He is judging the demonic principalities that have, that have, have, have spun his children in circles. I pray in the name of Jesus that there would be a separation. There would be a separation from those agreements, Lord, that we didn't even know we made. We know that resurrection is coming, and so we open our hands. We open our hands of all things, Lord, and we say, you sift, you do whatever you need to do because we just are so excited to be with you. We are in full anticipation that the spirit of resurrection is going to fall on us. Yeah. Yeah. I just thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Do you want to agree with that with me? Let's do communion together, is that okay? Yeah. This is my favorite part, that all this is possible because one man said, I will yield, I will take on he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become his righteousness. He took all of our distortions, all of the, the weird places where we don't see ourselves well. He took all of those. He took all of the places where death lingered. He took them and said, I give you righteousness. I give you life. I give you rightness. Ooh. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood shed for you. And so I just, I speak to this, to this cup that we're about to drink and I declare that blood carries life. It carries oxygen, it carries life. And so as we come into agreement with the blood of Jesus, carrying oxygen and carrying life, I just see a heart right now and I see 80% of that heart alive and beating but there's a 20% that hasn't, it's just decaying. And I, and I speak to that heart, these hidden places where our lives we've settled for good enough. 80% is good enough. I speak to that 20% and I say the blood of Jesus just flow. Begin to carry the oxygen in new ways to that heart in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Do this in remembrance of me. Oh.
There are some seasons where the Lord invites us to carry him in a way um, that isn't um, our first choice. And I believe he has a divine thank you for this season. There's so much he wants to say. There's a revelation, if you guys know what I'm talking about, when, when the disciples, when Jesus resurrected and the disciples hung out with him, we're talking the time between um, Easter Sunday and the ascension, right? We're talking weeks on end. Jesus just opened the scriptures and taught them because there was something that shifted from this moment in John 16 to that moment where they could bear it now, Right? And then there was a whole other measure of revelation that came at Pentecost, right? There was an assignment. There was an empowering that came at Pentecost. And so I want to invite us collectively to say he has so much on the other side of this, so much on the other side of this. And there are things that our hearts need to hear with the ears of the resurrection. Does that make sense? So I just bless you the next two weeks to, I mean, hunt, hunt him down like a bulldog. I don't know if bulldogs hunt. I should say bloodhound. That's a better, <laughs> it's a better animal breed. I apologize. I was kind of like hold on to him like a bulldog. You know, I was kind of mixing my, you guys know that I mix metaphors sometimes. So um, yeah, we just bless you to find him. He's there. Have a great week, two weeks, and we'll see you April 4th on Easter Sunday. Blessings to you guys.